so I broke most of the rules that we have in place in the hobby for successful isopod breeding. Yet, I had amazing success. And you know what? I think I might know why. Hello and welcome back to Bug Realms. On this channel we like to discuss all things creepy crawly. So if that's something that interests you, please consider subscribing to the channel. So let me tell you a little story and then I'm gonna show you exactly what has happened here. So as you know, I've had a massive interest in isopods lately and there was a small patch about a year or more ago, I can't remember exactly when, where I started to have an interest and got a few species. One of those species that I got back along was the Armadillidium klugi slano variant, also known as klugi or klugii. It doesn't matter how you pronounce it. I just say klugi. So I purchased what I believe to have been 10. That's what my memory serves. Could have been a batch of 20, but I'm pretty sure it was 10. So 10 is what we're going to go with for this story. Now, I kept them as idealistic as I could for that particular species and a few months went by no breeding no interest in breeding so i was like hmm this isn't great tried changing a few bits up nothing really changed and then one day i had a small brood appear now that small brood was only enough to have come from one female in there it wasn't a very big brood either. And I thought, you know what? There's something not right here either. I've done something wrong, or these clue guy are <clears throat> actually quite old. There weren't any deaths, but they just weren't, weren't breeding properly. So I left it a while. I waited for some of those mankai to grow up a little bit to around about half size. Well, probably less than half size, in fact, actually. And there were still no more breedings going on. And... I just thought it was a crashed colony. Yes, we had one little successful brood, but it wasn't great. Now, as you know, I have limited space here in the realm. So what I did is I asked my daughter if she would like to adopt these Armadillidium Kluge from me. And of course, being such a pretty isopod with the red skirt, she jumped to that opportunity. Now, in her room, we have a very large hissing roach tank that she keeps and she has had successful breeding from her hissing roaches quite decent amount of successful breeding i might add from her hissing roaches so we bunged what we had left in with them and then the miracle happened i will show you in just a moment stay tuned but before we do I've just wrote down briefly on my phone here a list of key components, key rules in isopod keeping that you should stick to if you want really successful breeding. And then we're going to go and have a look at these isopods, look at this tank and see which ones I stuck to, which ones I broke. Okay, so two key major important things for isopod keeping is your leaf litter and it should be from hardwood deciduous leaves such as oak. Okay, that is one of the key components. The next key component is rotten white wood. Again, this is from hardwood such as oak. Um, they're your major, major, major things. Okay, moving on from that, added nutrients in the soil. That's because a lot of isopod keepers will add various other things, whether that's activated carbon, uh, lump charcoal, um, uh, little additives in there. There's lots of different things, okay, that can be added into the into the substrate. It's not always needed, but it is what's often used for successful breeding. Uh, moss, moss is quite often used. A moisture variant is another key thing that seems to work um, with isopod breedings. And moisture variant means you have a damp side and a dry side to the enclosure so they can go to whichever side they need if they need that higher humidity or they need that hydration they go over to the moist side if that's getting a bit stagnant or they don't want that high humidity in the air or that that moisture gradient there they move on to the drier side okay uh, a calcium source quite important for their growth and molting 
alternative food so that is things like your fruit and your veg and your made premium bug grub type stuff as well added in uh, using chlorine free water such as spring water or rain water um, having a suitable size living space depending on the size of your colony so for example if you were going to have 10 this doesn't look very big but they were when I had my 10 they were in probably this big so from here to about here and roughly the same in height okay so that that gave enough space to move around but it also meant they were going to meet each other a lot um, so breeding would be more likely to happen it means they weren't going to get very territorial over different parts of the enclosure um, it was just an idealistic size for the amount that I had uh, what else is on this list um, oh and last but not least was suitable hides so we quite often as ice spot keepers will put a hide half over the moisture gradient and half over the dry gradient so that they can still hide and pick which side they want to um, also other hides are provided more hides for bigger colonies or larger hides for bigger colonies um, or more leaf litter to hide in either way kind of works so now you know those key components let's have a look at our armadillidium klugei slano i said klugei that time armadillidium klugei slano Let's have a look at this enclosure and let's see which of these elements I stuck to and which I didn't. And then I will tell you my theory on why this worked anyway. So upstairs we go to the hissing roach tank. So here in my daughter's bedroom is our hissing roach tank. It's a very large exoterra. Now I couldn't be bothered to bring my lighting up here. I'm gonna put a little lamp on. Now, this is all it is, okay? These scraps were put in yesterday. I normally make the scraps a lot smaller, but the roaches themselves are fine with them. And here is our actual baby roach. This is a baby hissing roach. Won't focus properly. Hello camera. You are a decent camera. Will you focus for me? There we go. That is a baby hisser. Now the problem with keeping hissers in exoterras like this is they do like to hide in the door frames which means when i open them sometimes they fall out now let's see first of all if we can find the isopods there's not many as you can see here it is daytime you get more out at night but let's have a look and then i'll tell you what i stuck to and what i didn't so let's move these scraps out the way there is a clue guy or klugi you ready Ta-da! look at that there are loads there, absolutely loads, absolutely tons. Uh, there, look at that. This is a booming success. There, look at that. These are beautiful isopods and we have had massive, massive success with these. And this is, what you've seen here is probably about half. This substrate depth is quite big. There is this giant cork bark for them to hide in. And believe it or not, there are, there are tons of hisses. They're just all inside. You can see an adult there. There are loads of hisses in here. But there are also loads of isopods. Let's put that back the best I can. There's none underneath there. But anyway, so as I said, that's about half of what you can see at night time when you lift things up. So let me get my phone out. And let's check which things I didn't do. And you can probably already tell a few just by looking in this tank. So while we have a look at these, let's go back to the start of the list. Key component, leaf litter. Can you see any leaf litter in here? Now she's had this them in this tank for a couple of months when we had this, these huge booms of babies. Oh, another hiss is trying to escape. You little swine. Um, and all I did was put in the leaf litter that were in their current enclosure, which had been eaten ages ago. And I've just left this tank for her to deal with, with the hissers, right? This is really a hisser tank. We thought this colony would crash, which is why we didn't supply everything isopod based for them. So the massive key component to all isopod breeding was practically left out. Insane. Rotten white wood. This is the, this and this little piece here is the only piece of rotten white wood 
that we chucked in there that is it that's been in here for a few months that is all they have had now in the substrate are beach chips and i put them in there because over time beach chips will disintegrate or, or will break down sorry break down for um, these animals to eat and feast on but that takes a lot longer than how long I've had them in here for it's because I was going to reuse this substrate later on and I wanted it to have that breakdown but it has not had that time for the lignum inside the wood to have broken down for the isopods to eat so all they've had is this one piece now obviously it's still there so it's still enough but it's not mixed in the substrate it is not everywhere it is not broken down into little clumps it is just one large piece added nutrients in the substrate there are none there is no activated carbon there's no mixed in uh, calcium source there's no mixed in anything in this substrate it is topsoil and beach chips that is all that's in this substrate so we have missed the leaf litter we have a bit of rotten white wood, but we don't have it mixed in, and we don't have added nutrients. Moss, there is no moss in here. The only moss that came in here, again, was from their past enclosure. All gone by now. Moisture variant or moisture gradient, we do have. So when we water this enclosure, we water the back because it stays moister, and we put some down the, the tube, but we leave the front dry, and this is where we keep our dry food as well. So we always leave the front of the enclosure completely and utterly dry. So we have stuck to that rule. Calcium source, as you can see, there's an old bit of cuttlefish bone here. Now this is the only calcium source they've had since I put them in here as well. So they do have a calcium source. There is none mixed into the substrate, and this is the only piece they've had for a long time. But there is still some on there, as you can tell. So yeah, we have stuck to it. We just may not have stuck to it fully in terms of how people keep isopods. Alternative food, we do do that because we feed the roaches. So at the minute they've got some leaves there, but we don't normally do that. We normally put bits of melon in or we put um, various fruits in or carrot, things like that. Um, we also have my premium bug rub that I made on my previous channel there that is added here. So we do stick to alternative food. Chlorine free water, we don't with these. You see, it's not too much of a hassle with hissing roaches. They're quite well adaptable. We use plain tap water. Now there are a lot of people that do use tap water for their ice boards too. It's just not really recommended, but we've had no harm coming from purely using tap water in this enclosure. Uh, small living space, we have completely failed. So if you remember, we had 10 with a small brood, a small brood of probably about eight to 10, maybe more. So there was roughly just under 20 in here. And this is a huge space, a huge space. We completely and utterly broke that rule. And last of all, suitable hides. Now there are lots of places to hide in here, I admit, but as you can tell, most of them stick to this piece of wood that we have there, under this piece, I don't want to keep disturbing them and under the cuttlefish bone now they do obviously have this whole cork bark tube to hide in as well they don't have that area of leaf litter they don't have lots of hides they don't have arched bits of bark but i can't say that i haven't stuck to it because we don't know how many are inside here with our probably hundred odd hissing roaches if not more so, so we kind of do have to tick that one off now I'm going to go back down to the realm, I don't want to be sat here in my daughter's room while I finish this video and I'm going to explain to you another baby here sir and I'm going to explain to you why I think that we had such success in this tank. Oh, squeeze round Sam, there we go. Okay, so also Armadillidium I forgot to mention are known more for their eating of, of vegetable matter than they are of the proteins as well. Whereas your things like your Porcelio Lavis are really big on protein eating. And uh, most of that premium bug grub is protein based. But of course, we did chuck the veg and fruit in too. So why do I think this was such a success then when I broke so many very important rules? There are two main factors why I think in my theory of this, why this was so successful. Remember, I put them in there thinking they were just gonna die off. So what is it? 
the two things I think it actually is it's because well actually there's more than two now I think about it there's more than two okay okay the two major reasons I think about it is because one, the bug grub that I created. So I created this on my old channel ages ago. You can find the recipe if you search through the old Bug Realms channel. And it has so many good elements in it. And I actually kind of experimented a little further with that food and added a few more elements in since then. But bulk of it is the same ingredients I used. And I think that that is holding so much of the nutrition that they need obviously the roaches exploded having babies there was far more than what you would have seen in there trust me normally when i open those doors at night time i've got to pull 10 just out the doors alone let alone how many are in that huge bit of bark right so those roaches obviously get everything they need from that food source which is why it was in there but it obviously contains so much that the isopods need that it didn't matter so much about large quantities of leaf litter that it didn't matter so much about large quantities of rotten white wood they were obviously needed at some point and although there was wood in there there hasn't been leaves in there for a long time and that is such an important element and it's not something i'm ever going to stop and i don't recommend you stop either and i am now that i've done this video actually going to add leaves into there to see if the population grows even further i don't want them unhappy now that they are exploding into having babies but I left it out there to show you how I'd kept them in this video. So I think that they are gaining the nutrients from that. But secondly, I think it's to do with the roaches. Now, these roaches are having an environmental impact in captivity within that tank. And I don't just mean that the isopods have these big bulky things scurrying around. I don't think it's having them there physically that is, is making a difference. I think it is their frass, their poo. So we talked in a worm video about how worms eat organic matter, the bacteria in their gut breaks it down further and adds extra goodness um, to, what's the word, condition the soil, uh, which would be great for isopods. What if roaches are doing the same thing? So these roaches are eating good amounts of fruit and veg plus they are eating my premium based bug grub that we've already discussed obviously contains really good nutrients but then what if there is a bacteria perhaps in their gut that comes out or combined sorry and then comes out as frass that the isopods have been feasting on that gives them that extra kick you see most animals will not breed in an environment they're unhappy in they will not breed especially in those numbers will not breed when the conditions are wrong. Okay, so you could be sitting there saying, this was all wrong, you just got lucky. It's not the way it works, guys. It is not the way it works. And Armadillidium plugi can be finicky. They, people either have great success or they have rubbish success. But the fact that I turned what was rubbish success into amazing success is incredible. Now, being a child, my daughter obviously rummages through that tank on a weekly basis and so on. So they are still getting that little bit disturbed. So it's not the fact that they are neglected that has done it. So to me, it's got to be a mixture of the food I provide and the frass of the roaches. And this is something we are gonna do an experiment on in the future. I am gonna be looking for more roaches, especially ones that can live arboreally and have you know, frass falls down rather than living in the substrate. So, and see whether the the population of ice pods that I'll add to a new roach tank will explode too. Who knows? This is the exciting thing about discovering things in the invert hobby. You want to know why, why this works. Can it work again? Was it just dumb luck somehow? Was it the food? Was it the roach frass? Was it just because it, it worked for Armadillidium klugi? Will it work for something else? I don't know, and that's what's exciting. So I cannot wait to get my hands on some more roaches to test this theory. Now, this video is actually recorded before Southwestern show. So if I had already picked up some roaches at that show, this will explain why I'm talking about needing roaches now, because I haven't actually been to the show yet. But this is exciting stuff to me. Now, I'd like you to comment below with your theories as well. Comment me below. Let me know your theories. Uh, if whether you're a substrate person, an isopod keeper, or you don't know anything about either and you still have your theory, let me know. Now, 
my th other thought process is the fact that that rotten white wood, that calcium source, were close together. So they had their hide, as well as their wood part, as well as their calcium all in one corner. And then they move to the other corner where they have the food. When they want darkness in the daylight, maybe they go into the tube as well, which is where there's going to be a lot of roach frass. Don't know so many things that it could be. And until we get more roaches to test this out, we aren't going to know. So I think that's going to be it for today's video because I could talk forever about theories and, 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 and substrates and roaches and isopods that I don't want you guys getting bored. But I would love to hear your theories below and of course now I'll be adding all those added extras for our isopods all of the rules that I broke will be added I'll let you know if it made an impact did it re-crash the armadillidium plugi or did it give them an even extra burst or did they just stay the same has there been things that we have not thought about that have happened in this tank with so many rules broken it's mesmerizing to me so anyway, thanks for watching guys. Again, please, please, please comment below with your theories and your thoughts on what has happened here. So I would love to read each and every one of them. Take care guys. Bye bye.